Uh, we're covering our Baptist distinctives as week five, but week two under two offices. Okay. So first Timothy three. All right. So just a review. Again, not insult anybody's intelligence, not be pedantic, but uh, what was the B in our acronym for uh, Baptist? Biblical authority. The, yes, okay, biblical authority for B. And then the A? Autonomy. Yes. Autonomy of the local church. And then P? Priesthood of every believer. Yes. All right, perfect. And then two, we got two T's in uh, the first, and we also have two S's. Two offices. Yeah, the first one that we're covering uh, this week, again, uh, is two offices. We didn't really get to finish it up last week. Uh, we barely even covered most of the pastor, and then uh, we're going to address deacons as well today. Um, and then just to go over as a review, uh, we've seen, okay, that from 1 Peter chapter 5, that the three responsibilities are addressing one individual. Uh, though there's three different terms that are used, uh, they all are interchangeably referring to the same individual. Uh, we commonly refer to him as a pastor, but in scripture he's referred to as well as a bishop, um, aka like an overseer, and then as well as an elder. And so, and that's referencing as well as far as his maturity, which we'll see, which we didn't get to last week, and then also as far as his, his age, it could be chronological. But it, hi, good morning. But it would be his, um, his, his, his maturity level primarily. But as well, it could be, it could be chronological, uh, and that's more of a Hebraistic idea. So, uh, pastor, his responsibility would be shepherding, feeding, caring, nurturing uh, for the souls of the individual. We see that as well. We didn't cover this verse uh, last week, but in Hebrews 13, uh, and I know Pastor has referenced this verse quite often um, in his preaching. And in particular, I remember from when he had mentioned about his ordination council, uh, that uh, there was a pastor on his, uh, on his ordination council that has preached a message regarding this, that um, obey them that have the rule over you. In verse 17 of uh, Hebrews 13, it'd be obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy, not with grief, uh, for that is unprofitable for you. Uh, we're going to be primarily in 1 Timothy 3, um, and that is that would be the shepherding aspect, the, the pastoring aspect of the responsibility. And then as well as uh, with 1 Peter, they mentioned about taking the oversight, and he gave direction as far as how he's supposed to do that, uh, not as a lord, uh, but rather willingly, and as well as that... Uh, not only we uh, believers are likened to in the book of Ephesians as a body and then as a building, um, and, but we are uh, an organization as well as an organism. Uh, and so in other words, he has responsibilities that has been given to him by God as well as us individually. And then corporately, when we gather together and to carrying that out uh, according to God's organizational structure, he's the... I guess the, the leader under obviously under Christ under the Holy Spirit of God uh, by direction of the Holy Spirit of God to guide us in carrying out our responsibilities All right, so 1st Timothy 3 1st Timothy 3 uh, we didn't get to cover this uh, we just kind of went over it kind of quickly uh, but we'll go back to verse 4 it says here, 1 Timothy 3, uh, verse 4, says, One that ruleth his own house, uh, oh, that ruleth well his own house, uh, having his children in subjection with all gravity. And the reason being, it says, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Okay, so it seems here he's mentioned initially as being one that is a uh, husband of one wife. Okay, and then it says here as well as, okay, having... Uh, one that ruleth well his own house and having his children in subjection. If his kids are out of control or if his house is out of control, um, his household 
wouldn't just be limited, obviously, to his kids, but it would be uh, his wife as well. But, so if he's not ruling his house, then obviously he's not going to be able to handle the responsibility of guiding others and then also leading by example, having folks look to him uh, for spiritual leadership with regard to, well, how do I handle my own household? Uh, if his house is a mess, if personally he's a mess, and then it's not going to be something that you would want to look towards. Uh, towards leadership, so that that would be a disqualifier there. Um, and then verse six, not a novice, left being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now he's gonna, there's going to be a term here similarly used in verse seven. Uh, he falls into the reproach and the snare of the devil, but it's two different things. Uh, he falls into the condemnation of the devil. Uh, silly question, I know, but what was that? What was the devil's condemnation? Right. I will, with five I wills, Isaiah 14. Yes, yes. Okay, so as a novice, num somebody that would be new to the faith, uh, newly saved, uh, somebody that doesn't have spiritual maturity to them, uh, you can have somebody that, I'm sure we've all seen this at some point, um, that you have somebody that maybe has been born again for a number of years, but they still carry themselves as very immature. Uh, they don't have control of their own emotions. Uh, they're hotheads usually, not always the case, but um, and they just you know run off at their mouth and that kind of thing. And so someone that would be a novice, um, given the type of responsibility that a, a pastor would have and that he is really supposed to be doing it, uh, for the, obviously for the glory of God, but for the betterment of the people that he's leading, uh, a novice would let that get to his head, let himself get big headed, and then next thing you know, he's going to be carrying himself on like, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Sorry, I guess this is probably irrelevant, but I, I was thinking of a football player, I can't think of his name now, but uh, he, somebody asked him why he never celebrated when he t made a touchdown, and he said, I don't want anybody to think I've never been here before. <laughs> but the thing is that the point is that with with experience for a pastor or anyone else, you get to the point where you accept your position, you have these responsibilities, but you don't feel like, uh, you, you just feel like you're doing your job. You're not, you're not, uh, there's nothing to brag about. You're just being obedient. And I think you need, a, a, a novice does get lifted up with pride. And I can remember when I was a young Christian, you know, being jealous of people that seemed to do better than I was. And uh, you get to the point where you, where you just accept God's will for yourself and yeah, you know, you, you I'm, I'm, I'm beating it to death. You go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. That's good input. Um, one thing I noticed as well is we're told in James that we're not supposed to be seeking to be many masters because uh, they have the greater condemnation. In other words, they, they, <laughs> they have a greater level of scrutiny to them. And I don't mean just on a human level, which obviously they do, but as far as uh, the greater the responsibility, uh, the, the greater the judgment is going to be when you stand before God. Uh, you have to give an account. We all do. You know, everyone, everyone's going to give an account before God. But that's a great responsibility that they have to give account, not just for themselves, but for the people that they're leading. And so the thing is, somebody that is going to be sober, uh, grave, temperate, you know, that's, they're going to have a mindset to them that realizes, hey, this is not about me. Uh, it never actually was about me to begin with. It's about Christ. And it's for the betterment of others. They, they're going to be truly uh, living as a servant, seeking to benefit whom they're leading, uh, and for the betterment of that, regardless of whatever uh, accolade or praise comes along or any kind of. They, they don't really care about that. They're only concerned about pleasing one. Mm -hmm. and that's that's Christ. Whether or not you know they'll hear "Well done" when they stand before Him, and not not as uh, not not really for any kind of. Uh, I know it's our human nature to want to get. You know, some kind of recognition um, when you when you put in hard effort and that kind of thing. Uh, but the fact is, this is not this is something that's kind of, in a sense, really scary because uh, you you know you don't, you want you want to be able to go ahead and look back and see that hey, the people that I've led or the people that I've influenced, the people that I've put into, that they're doing well. I mean, obviously they have a free will, um, and so they can choose to go ahead and reject and rebel and that kind of thing. But the fact is. Third John four fits that passage. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. Amen. Yes. I think that's the pastor's 
uh, the joy, one of the joys of the pastor. Yes, and, and the parent as well. So, not a novice, lest he be lift the earth with pride and um, fall into the condemnation of the devil. And then, moreover, uh, well, we're told, you know, God resists the proud and give the grace unto the humble. So, he's, <laughs> it's against God to be proud. And then, verse 7, it said, uh, must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Okay. So, snare of the devil is reproach. That's one of Satan's tools, uh, one of the adversary's tools to take a believer down. All right. So the fact is, he can't take you to hell with you know with him because uh, we're born again. But what he can do is he can influence you to make your life as ineffective as possible. And that's one of the means by which he does that, and that is through reproach. Okay. Now, um, that's that's not a good thing, you know. Obviously, we sin. Uh, if we sin, God's remedy for that if we confess our sins. Yes. So the big report means what sort of things should be said? Uh, Basically, a good testimony. He's, he's a fine yeah, it's a good testimony. Right. Now, here's the thing. Quite often, we, in our human nature, like to think as far as like, okay, well, I have to do these things, and then you end up with like, I wouldn't say split personality, but you uh, tend to do things more for public show than you do, you know, for true motive. Sure. But, the, you know, so a person shouldn't be one thing in public than he is in private. In other words, you, you should be consistent all the way around. Mm -hmm. If, uh, you know, you're holy in public, then obviously it should step from holiness in private. You know, you, you <coughs> maintain whatever standards uh, any of the convictions that you have, that should come from a heart of obedience and, and desire to want to please God, and not necessarily for show. So it's easy. Without to, outside the church, right? Yeah, without. In other words, because though, in other words, your testimony before unbelievers. In other words, those though, that don't have, because the believers are going to know, uh, you know, through interaction with you and that kind of thing. But they're going to they're going to have a better, closer relationship with you in that regard. But those that are without, no, those are that without the church. Those are that, those that are not believers. Those that are, that are, you know, born again. That you should have, in other words, they, you should, <laughs> you shouldn't be. Uh, uh, I don't put my coworkers on the black, but I okay. I've worked at certain places where, uh, you know, you got guys that are just hotheads. They just want to fly off the handle and then get in your face about things or just getting. Um, when I worked, <laughs> this is pretty, it's not funny, but when I worked security, uh, I worked security for about a little over seven years, so well, seven, uh, seven and a half years, almost eight years. Um, and a lot of the positions where I was at, it was primarily customer service. It wasn't even really security necessarily. You're dealing with public, uh, you put at a front desk or you're, you're putting, um, at the auction, I remember this was easy to do. Uh, you're, the responsibilities there were very minimal uh, security, actual security stuff that we would do was more just customers, customer relation, customer service. And so uh, you got guys that are uh, thieves, crooks, crooked, trying to do things to get a better deal on, on their vehicle. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, you're obviously tasked with trying to minimize the loss uh, that the company has uh, with that. So. Uh, you obviously have to confront a lot of people with regard to that, and then. But the fact is, in processing a vehicle uh, out of the lot, or even when you were dealing with somebody, say at a front desk where you're processing somebody, the fact is there's still somebody for whom Christ died, and regardless of how. Uh, again, it's not to be that you you're not firm as a leader or anything like that, but the fact is, you know, you have to be disrespectful or mean or ugly. Uh, a lot of these guys, well, not not everybody, but there was a number of them I remember in particular that. Because, I mean, we're not cops, so we don't have the same authority or anything like that, but we did have a little bit higher measure of authority on the lot. And so they, a lot of these guys carried themselves as if they were, you know, and then you get in somebody's face and like, okay, you want to throw down with somebody. It's like, okay, that's, that's not good customer service, good customer relation. Uh, regardless of whatever the guy did, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, one thing, if he initiated, and then you got to defend yourself, but, you know, you're not... You know, you're not supposed to wield your authority to kind of 
bully over people uh, just because you can and you think you can get away with it. Um, the point with that was is that uh, you know you meet them out of work, oh, the nicest, coolest people, you know, but then it's like, well, hey, <laughs> I'm gonna get steamrolled here, uh, meeting him. That, I mean, that's just one thing. You could you know you could have somebody that is you know incredibly foul mouthed or something. How would you test that? Though? How would you find out if somebody? Uh, for a pastor? Yeah, for a pastor, someone you're thinking about a way for an office of some kind. Yeah, pastor, or bishop, whatever. How would you find out if they had that sort of thing before they got it? Why don't you go talk to the neighbors? Mm -hmm. talk, I mean, you can. <laughs> but like pastor likes to say, you know, talk to the wife, talk to the kids. You'll hear. Uh, it says a good report of them who are without a reputation. You, your reputation precedes you. If you. You, know, when you can't get away with anything. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. You, there's a lot of people that are crooks, and that, that's you know that'll that'll show. Um, now, go to Titus chapter one. We'll be back here. We're going to jump back here, but I want to address something that's mentioned in Titus as well. Titus chapter one. I did mention this last week, but I still wanted to go over it again. Uh, starting in verse 6, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, okay, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, okay, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. Okay, um, the self-will, it's not your personal ambition. It's not to say that you can't be ambitious or desires to see God's church grow or have goals or anything like that, but in other words, it's not your personal, uh, not, you know, if uh, delight thyself in the Lord, he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. So God imputes his desires in you, but it's not, it's, it's, it's origin is not of you necessarily, it's, it's of God. As you yielding yourself to God, he's the one that puts that into you and then you work that out. And then go down to verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainseers. And for there uh, are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, okay, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And then, uh, so this individual, we're told in First Timothy he should be apt to teach. In First Peter, he's supposed to be feeding the flock. And then here's how, by means, he says, holding fast the faithful word that he has been taught. Okay, so this is somebody that's obviously going to have a teachable spirit. He's been trained. Uh, and then, as well, that he's able to, uh, through... His, not just his disposition, but knowledge of the word through the power of the Holy Spirit, be able to convince uh, the gainsayers and stop their mouths. And, and this isn't somebody that, uh, that is obviously going to be a novice or unwise, but he's going to be pretty skilled in the word. He's going to have an, not just an aptitude to be able to communicate truth, but to be able, to, and has a part to be able to go ahead and go after those that don't know God or even don't want to really know God. Uh, God wants to win those that subvert the God. Um, okay, these individuals whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, cheating things what they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Uh, this is a crook. That's an individual that we would see like turn on TBN or any other religious channel. Well, it, I guess locally it would be Channel 45. Um, I don't remember the acronym for the station, but um, locally it would be 40, uh, Channel 45. But as well as if you, you know, whatever you got cable, you got TBN or any of those other Christian stations that usually you have guys that are from uh, Church of Christ or Church of God background, or maybe more of a Pentecostal background. And they're out there um, basically trying to get grandmas. Um, yeah. 
and they um, <laughs> they have no shame about them as far as with regard to you know wanting to fleece the flock, take advantage of people, uh, God's people, uh, through well, a lot of times the believers that they take advantage of maybe don't exercise the best judgment with regard to that. They just are you know innocent or uh, maybe a little bit naive and uh, allow themselves to, oh, well, okay, he's promising good things, or it seems like, okay, let's, this may be a worthy cause or whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, these individuals are, are crooks. But here's the thing, God wants them to be convinced of truth. Uh, he actually wants to win them. You know, that's, I want to, well, in your flesh, you want to go ahead and take care of these guys and put, you know, take them out back or something, but the fact is, God wants to win them. That doesn't mean that they aren't going to have judgment to them for what they've done, but the fact is, God loves them. They're made in the image of God, and God wants to win them. So, uh, as a pastor, uh, well, I believe even as a, as a believer, you should have that type of heart where you seek to be able to go ahead and win those. Yes? Yeah, but there's, there's, there's more to it than that, because uh, the Bible speaks a lot about false prophets, and this is a false prophet he's talking about here. Yes. Uh, this is, these are the Joel Osteens of the world, and I, I don't know how you stop the mouth of Joel Osteen, but you need to uh, sharply rebuke them, and I, you can't obviously do that in person with somebody that's a national figure like that, but I think we need to warn new believers that these yes. people are just out for, for money. Now, I've, I've seen people taken in by Osteen and others, and they just, you know, they've got a few a few nice words make you feel good, but they, they really, you know, people just support them naively. He, when he came down, uh, I want to say it was last month, he was at the BB&T Center uh, out west, um, where the Panthers play, uh, by Sawgrass Mills, and uh, you, had, <laughs> you actually have to go pay to hear him. Uh, they had, I mean, it's a stadium, so you got stadium seating set up, and then the same as far as pricing for the seating as well as you would for, you know, like a football game or a hockey game or whatnot. And I was kind of surprised. I was like, wow, okay. Well, that shouldn't be because I know this guy's, he's a crook, but still, you know, who, <laughs> who pays to go hear the word of God? Yeah. Uh, if you're going to be top of truth, yes. We heard a sermon by Paul Washington. And he said, or, we empathize with these people that are drawn to that type of religion. But he said, it's really, it's God's judgment on them. They are drawn to what they want. And that's a hard word, but you can see that in many cases it's true. God says he will give people the wrong ideas on things. And they're where, they are where they deserve to be, even though we would love the full Thank you, thank you. First, but, but but on the other hand, we ran into somebody that that like Joel Osteen recently came to T's birthday party, and I had to really bite my tongue not to say something, because there's an appropriate time to to yeah. to say something. If he comes to me and says, "What do you think of him?" and I might have a chance to answer him, but you know, obviously he likes listening to the to the guy and. It's, you're not going to win any, any win him over by by just starting right out off the bat criticizing. You really have to use some tact. It depends on the individual. Yeah, uh, we're told in Jude on some having compassion, making a difference, and then others uh, saved with fear, pulling him out of fire, hating him in the garment spotted by the flesh. Um, honestly, he's good at what he does. Mm. He's not a Bible preacher, but he is good as far as as a motivational speaker. Um, if you were, I guess if you were following principles of uh, public speaking, he's actually, he's actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just he doesn't teach Bible. And then, well beyond that, he, he, st he well he stops, he, he's off doctrine on a lot of number of things, but he, he's just good as a motivational speaker, but beyond that he's not, there's no there's no depth or substance. There's no real. There's nothing to be benefited by spiritually, with, you know, with regard to listening to. Sorry, First Timothy chapter three again. First Timothy three. 
1 Timothy 3. Uh, verse 8 says, Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double tongued, uh, not given to much wine, not greedy, filthy lucre, and then holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And then let these also first be proved, then let them use the offices of a deacon being found blameless. Okay, this is a little different. Um, he doesn't have the same requirement necessarily, even though this requirement is almost identical as to the pastor. Uh, now, deacon, what is that? I know we use it all. It's kind of, if, if somebody was in church, what would you say that, what would you tell them? What's a deacon? What's somebody that come, what's that? A servant, some kind of a servant or assistant to the pastor. Uh, yes, go to Acts chapter 6. Keep your finger here, but go to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Verse 1 in Acts 6. It says, In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Okay, then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Uh, but we will give ourselves continually to the uh, to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the multitude, uh, the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and then it goes on and names all the others that. Um, in verse 6, okay, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they had laid hands on them. Then the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. Uh, so as a result of them establishing, this is where we have the first instance where it's mentioned uh, in the New Testament. Now the word itself is not used here, but here's where we first see it established as far as a position uh, or an office. So you have this contention here between the Hebrews and the Grecian widows that the Grecians feel neglected, that they're being looked over, passed over. Uh, they're not getting their fair share with regard to what's being handed out to them. At this point, you have believers in Jerusalem uh, that, in essence, basically they sold everything and that they're meeting daily uh, and from house to house that uh, they're breaking bread on a daily basis, they're meeting, uh, gathering, hearing of God's teachings. And it seems that, okay, so the widows uh, are being looked over as far as the Grecian ones. So the, the 12 disciples, or excuse me, well, the apostles really, they, they say, okay, look, we can't deal with this because it takes away from our personal responsibility as far as being able to go ahead and pray and study the Word of God and be able to minister. So we need individuals in here to give the criteria that are of honest report, full of Holy Ghost and wisdom. Okay, so uh, now Titus and Timothy elaborate more on that, but initially it was just somebody that would be of honest report, full of Holy Ghost and wisdom. So he's controlled by God's Spirit, he's a wise individual, and he has an honest report. He's a, yes. Did you ever look up what the word diakonos means and as compared to doulos, which is a, a, a bond servant, or perhaps uh, diamonos, which is a helper? Uh, what is used to translate devil usually, but uh, what, what's the distinction of this word diakonos? What does it mean? They, they were given this responsibility. We read that in the New Testament. We don't have that responsibility in the churches today, so we kind of have to decide what are the responsibilities of the deacon? Okay, so a deacon, literally, the word means uh, as a servant, like a waiter, somebody that waits at you. Okay. At, he waits at your feet, he waits, uh, you know, serving food, uh, drink, that kind of thing. Uh, doulos is a bond slave. Okay, so in other words, that's mm -hmm. a different individual altogether. He is somebody that has, you know, doesn't really have, well, 
we don't have chattel slavery here in the U.S. anymore. Uh, but at that time, that would have been commonplace over there in Rome. Well, not just in Rome, but in Jerusalem, it would have been commonplace in the old world, the uh, Middle East. Um, so it would be somebody that would be sold as property, but he's serving out of love. He's not serving necessarily out of... Uh, uh, the, the bond slave would be somebody that would have willingly given himself over. So he's serving the people at the direction of the pastor. Peter, in this case, is the pastor, and he's directing them to serve the people in, in a need, particular need they had. And so what, if we had a need in our church, then the pastor might direct you or someone else to, to meet that need. In practice, yeah, a deacon would be the one that, okay, they were the, here was the business. They had to figure out, okay, who, how many people do we have that we need to feed? And then uh, what's the logistics of feeding everybody? Where are we going to get our supplies of food, of drink? Uh, where are we going to get our plates? Or, you know, if they had utensils that they were using as well, uh, where are we going to put away our supplies? Where are we going to, they, they're going to handle all the busy work as far as being able to feed. That was originally what the deal was. Well, what I was getting at was that a lot of, in a lot of Baptist churches, deacons become a position of authority and they actually order the pastor around. It's kind of oh. it's kind of putting things backwards. The pastor is the head of the church, and the deacons serve at the discretion of the pastor. That's what I, what I the way I see it. I see. Okay. No, that's not biblical. Basically, the deacons were there just to alleviate of the I guess you could say the mundane responsibility, so that he can focus on the spiritual things of prayer and ministry of the word, because uh, that was taking up too much of their time to be able to go ahead and do that. Okay. So they were supposed to go ahead and take care of um, basically everything else, but it, it needed to be somebody of character, good character, so that the thing, the work would be able to get done. They wouldn't uh, go lacking, or it wouldn't be somebody that okay would bring reproach uh, upon the ministry, but rather just somebody that would be trustworthy, uh, honor, support, you know, full of the Holy Ghost. And then we're told, in, uh, I'm sorry, go back to Timothy, First uh, Timothy three. He was supposed to be somebody, and now he gets a little bit more specific with that. Not just of honest report and full of Holy Ghost and wisdom, uh, but it says here that uh, it's supposed to be not double-tongued. Okay, not double-tongued. Okay, so he's not somebody that's going to be speaking back or speaking bad about pastor or leadership. He's not going to be somebody that is going to uh, say one thing here to say something else another place. Um, and then not, obviously not given to much wine, uh, not greedy and filthy lucre, so he's not going to be a covetous individual. He's not going to be somebody that is allowing uh, external, well, in this case it's a vice, but it would, he's not going to allow external appetites to control him or dictate uh, his decision making or um, you know, controlling his flesh. And then verse 9, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Okay, so he's going to be somebody that is going to be knowledgeable of the Word of God. Okay, so this one's going to be an apt individual in handling God's Word. Okay, he's not, again, as, uh, even though it's not mentioned specifically, he, he wouldn't be somebody that would be a novice. It would be somebody that would be knowledgeable uh, of God's Word, would have experience with it. And then here's something that's a little different, even though it's not mentioned with regard to the pastor, uh, verse 10, it says that let this first be proved and then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Okay, so let them first be proved. In other words, the idea there is being tested, uh, put to the test. Uh, it's the same word actually as, well, same root word as uh, what would be reprobate. So reprobate is just you have the alpha primitive on the front of it, but you don't have, it's the same idea, the word reprobate would be, okay, you know, you prove don't, them false. Yeah, or you don't pass the test. But this, you know, okay, let them be first proved, let them be tested. So this is an individual that should be able to go ahead and withstand testing with regard to, hey, is this an individual of honest report? Is he of good character? Is he somebody that would be trustworthy, that would, we could put over you know, handling business in the church. Uh, that it isn't going to be bring reproach uh, to the name of God or to the work of God. And uh, 
So kind of describing the office of an assistant pastor here, I think, it's uh, the deacons, what the deacon does is assist the pastor. In practice, yeah, modern day, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. uh, the assistants, um, <laughs> I always get, well, I wouldn't say confused, but I, I, when I think of pastor, I always, even if you add, you know, assistant to it, and so I'm always thinking, okay, okay, so this guy is a spiritual leader. So how do you, how would you, how would you liken that in the sense of, um, I would think almost in a sense of a ch military chain of command. Uh, so in any unit, you have your commanding officer, and then you have your executive officer, and then you have the other officers that are under him, and depending on what type of unit it is, say it's an it's a aircraft um, uh, maintenance wing. So then you would have not only your uh, administrative office, but then you have logistics, and then you have the number of shops that you would have in your you know, uh, mechanic shop, body shop, uh, avionics, and then the tool shop um, that would be in there. And so each one has its own head within that obviously is going to answer, even though it's a different department. Uh, you have your top individual within that shop, uh, and then they all obviously answer to the XO and then CO. Yes. But is there any indication that anyone answers to a deacon? No, 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 no. I'm just yeah. saying that when I when I hear that term, that's 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 what comes to mind. But the fact is, it's he's just somebody that's tasked by you know by leadership. So, to, hey, so it, it is true in the sense of the top down, he answers to the pastor, but not that others answer up to him. Mm -hmm. Unless it's they delegate. answer to the pastor. Yeah. Unless it's delegated in some way. I mean, on a practical level, I would just think, okay, that would be something that would be delegated, but, you know, he, he doesn't really carry any weight or authority outside of the fact that, okay, he's responsible for administration to be able to alleviate pastor to, you know, focus on a prayer of the ministry of the Word. And to add what, what John said, you know, I mean, every in every way that we can see in the Scripture, I think it looks like, yeah, he, fills the role of an assistant pastor. What we would call an assistant pastor most of the time now is what the Bible talks about a deacon doing. Yeah. You know, doing full, it seems like a full-time role. It seems like um, it includes preaching, which that's something an assistant pastor does. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, Philip, the evangelist, he was a deacon. He would be, um, you know, he was an evangelist. And you have other and Stephen was a preacher too. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so he would be, yeah, somebody that would be. It doesn't seem to be like a requirement, since we don't hear about any of the others doing it. But as far as preaching, right? No, but he does have to be able to handle the word. In other words, he, right. that is a requirement. He has to be knowledgeable in the word of God. Um, but outside of oh, uh, and the, I'm sorry, did I answer your questions? Or, yes, I have a yes, <laughs> um, it, Sometimes I think it depends on the size of the church, too. We're in a small church. We have very little needs. My daughter, however, is in a larger church in a city, and her husband's assistant to the pastor, but they also have deacons. And so anyway, but because they have multiple ministries and multiple um, people they have to reach, too, Many, many times the son-in-law is sent to the hospital because pastor can't get there or he's somewhere else or he has to preach that Sunday morning and he's running the school. Well, then the deacons are doing all of the other things with the finances and praying together and things like that for the pastor and working together with him. So it, it might kind of depend on the size of the church. Too. That's a good point. That is a very good point. I overlooked that, but that is a really good point. There. Um, as a need arises, basically, is, is what it comes to mm -hmm. with regard to that. And so, as the Spirit would lead, as the need arises. Um, verse 11. Uh, this is not mentioned for the pastor, necessarily. Uh, but this is mentioned specifically for the deacons. It says that, even so must their wives be grave, uh, not slander, sober, faithful in all things. Um, and then it does mention with regard to, the, this is a repeat of what it says, 
with regard to the pastor says being the husbands of one wife, uh, ruling children in their own house as well. But even so must their wives be grave, not slender or sober, and then faithful in all things. Okay, so this is interesting. It gives a requirement for the wife as well. You would you would think, okay, this would be kind of common sense, but um, grave and sober, same I, same concepts as it would be for the pastor. He's going to be somebody that would be serious-minded. Uh, they're not going to be um, foolish individual. Okay, they're not going to let their decision making be influenced by personal desires or passions. They're not going to be influenced by external vices or external pressures or external uh, things. They're going to be in control of themselves and uh, not slanders. Okay, not a slander. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> we have a lot of that. Uh, not here in this ministry, but I'm saying as far as in Christianity, just in general, overall, as, as I've noticed that um, the longer I'm saved, that that's one of the things we tend to overlook or just excuse as, oh, it's not that bad, it's sin, but it's something that, <clears throat> it's really characteristic of the devil. He's a slanderer. Uh, and so, sir, oh, did you raise your hand, sir? Yes, I was, I was just thinking that then uh, a pastor, basically, if he's going to call, uh, get some deacons, he's going to have to look around and he's going to have to make some judgments on whether that deacon is all that he should be and whether his wife is. So it's not that he's judging the people. He just has to look it over and make that decision. And we all then should feel that we better be doing our best because the Lord's watching too. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, definitely. Somebody has to make, somebody has to make the decision of whether the wife is grave, whether she slanders anybody, and whether she's faithful to her husband. So the pastor basically has to look around, and before a deacon can be nominated for the position, they have to be looked at. So are we, are we living the kind of life that we should be living? We need to search our own lives and make sure we're not double-minded. We're not walking wrong before the Lord and before the pastor and before the people. Right. So I think by implication, all these requirements to the deacon also apply to the pastor. Sure. Yes. Because that, that's where it's really stemming from. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, hey, if anybody... And he starts off with, if anybody desired the office, then he desireth a good work. So in other words, if he's got that urge, that burning urge inside of him, then he's going to discipline himself and he's going to work towards that. So God gifts, because uh, we're told in Ephesians 4 that he gave some, uh, but it is possible if you get that desire, then, okay, hey, look, this is a criteria. You can work towards that. Um, and it's, our brother mentioned here, okay, word mentions that they first should be proved, so we should be able to be tested. Uh, and ultimately, where do these individuals come from? I know, yeah, God gifts them and he gives them to the church. And a lot of times, you may be born, maybe even grow up in church like me. You know, I, was born, I was born again when I was 20 years old, so you know, I didn't even grow up in church like that, so I'm you know, okay, pastor's here. Uh, our pastor passed away, so now we had another one. Some committee voted this other thing in. Uh, so it must come from Bible colleges or something. Uh, but the fact is, they come from within us, like the congregation, regardless of whenever you're born again. Uh, the fact is, God will call from out of us, you know, to go ahead and lead and to use and to, to guide and to such. So we have to be, uh, as our dear brother here said, that. Um, of that caliber of character, or seek that. If we don't, if we fall short, then hey, look, we can confess it and go ahead and turn around and then seek to be, so that we would be of that caliber. Even if God doesn't call us to that, because this is good Christian character to be able to go ahead and have, uh, to, to be as a leader. All right. Um, we have time for questions. If you if you do have any questions, uh, if you could write them down or you can approach me, or whatever. Now I'll go ahead and answer. Uh, but. Uh, the next week we're going to be looking at individual soul liberty. Okay, so uh, we're dismissed.
that's really important that we understand those offices. I don't see it misapplied so much in church. Yeah, a lot of it is. <laughs>